Welcome to day two of the Australian Chamber of Commerce Vietnam Education Symposium 2021. My name is Aaron Fennell. I'm the co-chair of the OzCham Education and Training Committee, uh, along with one of OzCham's life members, Brian O'Reilly. I'm also MC of this event. This symposium was meant to be an in-person event earlier this year in both Ho Chi Minh City and in Hanoi, and the OzCham Education Training uh, Committee has worked hard for several months to bring this event online for 2021. Uh, as of this morning, we've had 314 registrations across the two days for this event. Uh, following on from yesterday, I have some housekeeping pointers for everybody. Firstly, if you were here yesterday, we've uh, turned off the ping sound, so you don't have to worry about turning that off yourself in your, um, in your participant box when people enter and leave. Uh, secondly, the chat box is open for questions for presenters. You can also provide comments and positive feedback on the symposium there. The final session today is also uh, about audience engagement. And so we're going to go into smaller breakout rooms for feedback and input uh, on this event and also for future events. Uh, I, I'd like to highlight that some, but not all presentations will be shared via the OzCham YouTube site next week. So please take notes and screenshots if you're um, deeply engaged in one of these sessions. Uh, and then finally, I'd just like to point out that we have made pre-recordings of some of these sessions due to internet connectivity concerns across Vietnam. And we will cue the tape if, if people do drop out uh, if needed. The symposium title is Realizing Opportunities and Partnerships in a Digital World. And we have three themes which we have used to design the content. They are firstly, the positioning of Australian education in Vietnam. Secondly, the digitization of education. And thirdly, partnerships with, between institutions in Australia and Vietnam. The full lineup and details are available on the OzCham website and via your registration link. And we have another full morning of presenters who are leaders in their institutions and who are all at the top of their game. It's a real privilege to bring them all together. Now, I would like to introduce Mr. Jimmy Pham, founder of Koto uh, and CEO of Koto and vice president of OzCham for opening remarks. Uh, a little about Jimmy. Jimmy has a very long list of accolades and awards, um, but one I'd like to highlight, he was appointed a member of the Order of Australia, uh, an honor acknowledging his significant service to the community, particularly with marginalized children and youth in Vietnam, which he received in 2013. Uh, Jimmy, over to you. Thanks, Aaron. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, um, thank you so much for being with us on the second day of the symposium. I hope you have a, a very strong coffee in hand and a, a, a big hearty breakfast this morning. Um, I would like to commence by acknowledging the support from Moet with uh, Dr. Pham Gordon Hung. Speech he gave yesterday is indeed clear to us all that we're on track uh, with our bilateral relations in the education sector. Thank you to, to OSCHAM, our colleagues, and my fearless leaders, OSCHAM President, Mr. Simon Pugh, uh, OSCHAM Education Committee is led by the always convivial uh, Mr. Aaron Fennell. Um, as uh, rightfully Philip Dowler uh, summed up well yesterday, he said by putting uh, this educational event together, uh, it meant that we, uh, we went from plan A to plan B and then plan C. Yet as always, the team was resilient and positive throughout the entire process. So thank you, Aaron, and your team. I would also like to congratulate the work of Austrade and the Education Department at the Australian Embassy. Hanoi, a special shout out to Rebecca Paul, Abo, and uh, Jen Bahan. Thank you for all the work that you do uh, in pushing the significant bilateral partnership between Australia and Vietnam. From a personal standpoint, on behalf of DVET community in Vietnam, thank you for all the hard work together with the Vietnamese government to eventually to see the 10 year plan, uh, building on from a very solid foundation that the Australian VET community provider he has started and it's been recognized by the Vietnamese government for its excellent curriculum development, capacity building and job placement success. We're incredibly grateful for the talent that gathered uh, yesterday uh, and the eclectic group of professionals sharing the, our platform. On behalf of OSCHAM Vietnam, thank you so, so much. I'm sure you would agree day one was a huge success. Of course, today the people gather are equally impressive with the range of topics uh, that we ha they have prepared for you to listen, interact, and connect. I truly hope that you will stay for the full two hours. 
the what, why, how, who, and when of the Education Symposium has already been covered by my colleague, Simon Pugh, the theme as well as what we hope to achieve. So my job today is to bring to the forum the discussion of the VET curriculum, the showcasing of Vietnamese who have benefited from the VET qualifications and the pathway of where they are now and what potential they can, uh, and where they can potentially go. Having grown up in Australia, I benefit vastly from the education system, from primary school to finishing my U12 at TAFE and then a private uh, vocational college. This led, then led me to a path to a 23 year delivering a TAFE curriculum here in Vietnam, and now finishing up my EMBA uh, at one of Vietnam's top international university, RMIT. For those who may not know, I run a not-for-profit social enterprise called Koto, No One Teach One. To note, Koto was Vietnam's first social enterprise. We deliver a 24-month hospitality training to at-risk and disadvantaged youth. We work with Boxer Institute to deliver a Cert 3 qualification in food and beverage and commercial cookery, depending on our trainee selection. Because the group we work with often hail from volatile and damaged background, we knew providing them with vocational training wouldn't be enough for them to survive in the harsh world of the hospitality industry. So to counteract this, we incorporate life skills to ensure that they have confidence, empowerment, and a positive outlook. Now, we have partnered with Apollo Language Center to provide our language, our, our trainees with um, English training that was specifically designed for the hospitality industry. The 24 months of our trainees are combined with accommodation, training, care, and a family. The outcome of this investment is what uh, is that we have a skilled, confidence, empowered hospitality professionals that are placed in the ho top hotels and restaurants across Vietnam and globally. To date, I'm happy to say Kodo has placed over 1,200 graduates, and we have 100% job placement success upon graduating. What's more, we also have graduates who are now scattered across the globe in jobs and managerial positions in hotels, resorts, entrepreneurs in their own businesses, front of house on cruise ships, and head chefs at some of hotels, Hanoi's top restaurants and hotel. Some have used their certificate to study further with advanced diploma, degree, and even MBAs. The VET not only gives you a pathway to achieving your dreams, even if you come from a marginalized background, but the curriculum is also relevant, consistently being updated. It is non-economic because it's learning by doing. It's quality focus because the trainers are trained and supported properly and monitored by the Australia Qualification Framework. Finally, you are held accountable with proper policies and procedures in place and supervised by your partner. And in our case, it's Box Hill Institute. The industry comments about our graduates is that they have a good grasp of the industry basic, a strong command of the English language, and have a real positive attitude. I would like to give a special uh, shout out to Tony Watson, who was here yesterday, and Box Hill CEO, Ms. Vivian King. Thank you for your continued support and guidance in the area of VET in Vietnam. We hope to uh, the work that we do together with William Anglis, Chisholm, and many more Australian Institute, uh, a combined effort to make the VET sector relevant in Vietnam and Australia become the industry leaders. Now, to come to an end, thank you so, so much. I hope you do enjoy the rest of the symposium. I hope to receive your support. Uh, we hope to receive your support next year as much as we love to have this interaction with you apologies for the two d's uh version this year however please watch up uh, which please watch this space we have begun thinking about what the next year education event will look like we are beyond excited to engage with more australian in education institute with a 3d and who knows maybe an expo our purpose is to push the australian and vietnam agenda whether it's through language training and opening more language centers more phd candidates or address the skill shortages through the DVET. We have a wealth of experience between us and we're building some incredible Vietnamese and Australian alumni. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jimmy Pham, the Vice President of Ozcham uh, in Vietnam uh, and also the founder and CEO of Koto. 
Uh, Jimmy, we're certainly looking forward to all getting back to Koto when uh, the uh, current restrict restrictions end. And it certainly is wonderful to see Koto graduates all across uh, Vietnam in top restaurants. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, Same here. Uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, Miss Rebecca Ball to provide a keynote uh, speech for today. Rebecca Ball is the Senior Trade and Investment Commissioner, Vietnam and Cambodia at the Australian Trade and Investment Commission. Based in Ho Chi Minh City, Rebecca leads the AusTrade Vietnam team, which is focused on growing Aus Australia's trade, investment and education relationship with Vietnam and Cambodia. Rebecca Ball commenced her posting to Vietnam in February 2021, returning to the market after first working in Ho Chi Minh uh, in 2020. Prior to her current role, Rebecca was the Executive Director, Investment and Trade, Western Australia. Rebecca, welcome. Good morning and thank you, Aaron, and great to see so many people on the line, so many familiar faces and so many new friends as well. And Jimmy, lovely to see you as always. And as per you, um, your acknowledgements, I just reiterate, um, we've had such great support from the Ministry of Education and Training. And I'd just like to acknowledge the efforts of Auschan in bringing this together and the Australian Government through my colleague, Jennifer Barn, um, who is our Education Councillor for the Department of Education and Science and Employment um, in Hanoi and, and ourselves with Austrade that we're very happy to support the program today. And a big shout out to the Austrade President, um, Simon Pugh. So great to be here. Um, as Aaron alluded, um, I've been back in the market. Uh, my first time was in 99, 2000 when I was working for Moet um, on a corporate, um, I guess, change management project, um, commercialising corporate training programs um, for companies such as Vinamilk, Unilever and HSBC. So great to have worked at the grassroots level um, with, with Vietnamese community members building their executive skills and now coming back to lead an incredible team of dedicated um, um, Vietnamese young professionals in, in Austrade and across the um, consulate in Ho Chi Minh City and in Hanoi. So just the next slide. Um, we, we've titled ours, What Now, What Next, when it comes to um, how we're going to keep um, the, the pressure on um, and in Vietnam of our brand of education and training offerings and make sure that we're optimizing as many opportunities as we can in the digital world. So the presentation today, I'm just going to do a brief overview of the market. But I'll give all these slides to you because I really want to focus on just a couple of slides um, and you'll be able to um, take this with you. But we're going to cover the market, a little bit about um, what's going on with education. Many people on the call here, I can see it's a very clicked mix. We'll know some um, are both from onshore and offshore, so I don't want to um, tell you what you already know, uh, but we will touch on what we are seeing as challenges and opportunities with feedbacks from our partners, particularly the agent networks, and what we're doing, some of the things um, around recovery and um, preparing for recovery and renewal as we look forward to the borders reopening sometime in the future. So next slide, please. So I don't need to go through this too much. It's been touched on before. Key thing is that there's there's key um, commitment from both our leaders and our administrations and our community led by the needs of industry to drive um, a greater position with the bilateral relationship to be top 10 trading partners. And of, with our position in the market um, in education and training, Vietnam being the fourth largest source market, our absolute goal is to maintain that and grow that share through various creative means. And we'll do that through a whole of government approach. So next slide, please. I think we all, those in the market um, uh, and those in Australia, um, when it comes to, next slide, please, Becha. Um, with COVID and the impacts of uh, COVID on the education sector, I might just move that, there we go, great. Um, we all know we're in the fourth serious wave and that's um, really drawing out, particularly for um, parents who are having to homeschool um, their children or Young, young, young people who are wanting to commence online in Australia or having to work um, from home um, with not necessarily the most optimal speeds of internet. And it's quite challenging because we all know um, university is often around the social side and getting to know one another and, and making new friendships. So there's an awful lot of creativity going on with the Australian um, providers um, to, to create those more dynamic, um, I guess, workspaces, um, different places to, to meet, hook up, hangouts and the like, but it is becoming um, clear that while the digital penetration of um, uh, education offerings in Vietnam is coming from a very low base, there's going to be, and there is currently, a, a, you know, a fairly 
um, substantive um, uh, transition and it's a bit of a revolution, a digital revolution. So just move on to the next slide, please. Just going, I'm going to move around um, just a bit of data, but I'll flip through this uh, because this is um, something that there's, there's plenty of notes behind here. I'm sure, sure um, those in the market um, will be aware that um, we are um, within the top four um, as a source market, and it's although our enrolments last year were around 21, over 21,000, this has seen a decline of over 15% in the last year due to those constraints um, of being able to, to travel and, and really fulfil. That has, however, seen that uh, the delivery of um, transnational education through our providers in market, um, of which we have a growing number, um, they've been very um, well, um, I guess, subscribed to. And we're really buoyed to see how, how well our providers in the market have been adapting and responding to the needs of industry with, with new short courses, um, increasing number of micro credentials coming on board for more flexible online learning. So next slide, please. So this is this, this next slide, please, um, in regards to a wee bit on the Vietnam market itself. Might get you to just progress the slide there, please, John. Thank you. Next one. <laughs> okay. Um, we're doing point to point, so I'm very grateful for the technical support behind the scenes. Um, oh, that's okay. The next market, okay, we'll go to that one. That's cool. So one thing I'd said at the outset is that we listen to industry, we, we, we respond to industry and we adapt accordingly. We um, take a lot of feedback from our loyal, dedicated agents in the market and they qualify for us what we know are the trends um, and what we need to be doing to respond to um, the shift of um, students looking for other study destinations when they want to study physically abroad. Uh, and we do what we can to provide that input from industry and from families and students into um, the policy considerations through the DESI, uh, through Jen's team and through the Home Affairs as to what we need to be thinking about to um, get the settings right, to um, turn back the dial from um, people shifting their heads from Australia to other countries which are further away and quite frankly, not necessarily where um, the students or the parents want them to go. It's just being able to say there are different ways we can support you and your study um, journey. We also need to be very mindful that when we're looking at um, online delivery and the digitalization of, of the offerings that we are we are demonstrating the the accreditation the, the the qualifications framework how it links in with with employment outcomes to to ensure and, and reinforce that these offerings are value for money but there is ongoing through all the institutions and education training service providers you know there's there's quite a lot of i guess modelling being done on, on what, what are the sweet um, competitive price points. And that's where there's quite a lot of exciting new um, programs coming out in the, in the short courses and the micro credentials, which people can, can modularise um, and, and really be um, you know, much more adaptive in the way they put together their qualifications. We're also seeing um, the third piece of feedback, which has been distilled from agents, is that um, not only are the long range um, markets such as the US, Canada and the UK, um, you know, being, being a, a challenging, uh, challenging us in the competitive space, but we're also seeing increased competition from the likes of Singapore and Malaysia. And that's where we need to really demonstrate that, um, you know, through the Australian Qualifications Framework and, and, the, and, the, and the credential system, um, that the, the, the Australian um, offerings um, are still um, way high above, um, well, to, to demonstrate that case, um, than those um, across the region. An ongoing, an ongoing effort by all of us. Next slide, please. So the challenges and opportunities, yes, increase who they are. We're, we're constantly analysing that, mapping that, seeing what they're doing to see what we can do to counter that with different um, in, innovative ways to, to catch the attention of students and keep them engaged um, and, and wanting to be um, studying with Australia. Um, the, working on the perceptions of online education, how to continually secure the pipeline and then look to see you know, what, what those opportunities are in markets. So doing a lot more work um, with um, priority sectors, whether it's in the, in the logistics space or the health space or the health tech or, or the financial services, 
ones where the priorities of Vietnam are part of their economic development goals and how we can then assist with that with, with very, um, you know, very employment solution-based um, um, service offerings in ENT. So moving to the next slide, please. So what now? Um, what are we doing in response to um, some of these some of these trends? Uh, we've been doing um, a scoping study um, prior to COVID on what what might be some of the educational technology um, opportunities in Vietnam, and that's going to be revised due to um, we're in another world than we were when we when we started that. But that will provide us with a good comparative analysis as to where we're heading and what 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 how people's perceptions have changed. We've undertaken um, a number of webinars on, on ed tech across, across the region, um, including Vietnam. And then we're also working um, with the, you know, the Internet Association of Vietnam and with um, a group called EduGrowth uh, to um, look, really map out um, uh, the channels and the partnerships and how we can actually find delivery um, pathways for um, ed tech um, solutions. And we've also um, worked up with our onshore network with all the suppliers of the Australian education and training system to develop a network and a directory. And that now is going to be something we will be working um, with the networks, including, you know, including Auscham, um, DESI and our other partners through the agent networks and, and the departments to, to really showcase um, the, the relevant um, and, and potential supply um, opportunities to help with the, the Vietnamese um, um, you know, community taking up, the Vietnamese student community taking up ed tech, um, ed tech um, offerings. So the next slide, I just want to finish off really on what else we're doing by way of um, positioning, branding and helping us to um, maintain, um, you know, the flag flying high for Australia. We've got a really exciting program underway called um, Shine with Australia. We've partnered with VTV7 um, for a six month long um, TV campaign of 22 um, episodes in a series uh, targeting students um, with IFO Tonight um, and a digital campaign and social media um, series of, of competitions and interactive um, activities for, for students to, to get involved in. And the purpose of this is really to showcase all the different facets of Australian education and training system. Um, we've partnered with all the states and territories and it's been wonderful to have their, have their support and commitment and it's been a real, real whole of government um, you know, effort. And you know, with also with DESI and DFAT and our colleagues at CSIRO and the like and, and wonderful stories of Vietnamese alumni doing incredible things now back here in Vietnam and or in industry, whether they're in industry and government, in the community sector, uh, in the public sector, really um, great stories and, and, and so much fun. And the purpose here is really to, to boost our partnerships and identify more opportunities, um, both in the market and, and really um, you know, have, have the faces of the Vietnamese students telling their, telling their experience and their stories and, and then us being, being able to show that we are, we are really dedicated to, to, to bringing the best of our education training offerings to, to the Vietnamese students. So we've, we've held a number of, we've, we've run a number of episodes now. Uh, we've, the first two episodes um, actually had a hit rate of over two and a half million people watching um, the, the, the programs and, you know, just such big, big uptake. And we're now on to the filming. We've done five of the 22 and we've got, you know, a real, really exciting program ahead. So we'll, we'll send you all the links. So we do hope you sign in and look in and, and join in and like and share and, and comment because it's a really fantastic campaign. I just want to acknowledge my team who are on the line today. As we'll know in um, Hanoi, um, Ms. Chin Chin in, in Ho Chi Minh City and Ms. Hien Lei who's also in Hanoi. So I'll just pass on to the next slide um, to, to close out and there we go. Yeah, so key for us just to continue to build confidence and trust, keep our pipeline you know, ticking over, keep it, or keep it growing, keep looking at ways to engage with students and agents, make sure we're giving market updates um, to onshore in Australia to see where those partnership opportunities with Vietnamese institutions and corporates look to see how we can strengthen our partnership with Study Australia Partnership, which is where we work with the states and territories, lots of other 
avenues to have partnerships with government agencies, whether it's the Department of Health or whether it's the Department of Foreign Affairs or Department of Industry in Vietnam to see where we can continue to deliver training opportunities, as well as looking to see how we can leverage our regional network. And I'll just close out and show you, introduce you to our team. If you don't already know them, next slide, please. So I'm so grateful to have the absolute expertise and support of these amazing people on the screen, but we also have other people across the Austrade team in Hanoi and in Ho Chi Minh City who work with us on those industry opportunities in R&D and training. And we are absolutely delighted to have the really ongoing dedicated support of our Consul General, Julianne Cowling in Ho Chi Minh City and her team, and of course, our indomitable um, and effervescent um, leader, um, our ambassador, Robin Moody in Hanoi, um, alongside our counsellor, Education Councillor Jen. So thank you all for having um, me on board today, Aaron and the team there at Oscham, all the best with today. I'll be in and out of the session. Uh, my colleagues, um, Hung and Titi will also be on the line um, when we when we come through the question time to, to take any questions that we we can answer today and we'll make sure we send through the pack information so you have that at hand to to continue to um, um, provide us with some feedback on other information you might be needing from our work um, from the Australian Trade Commission which is very much about um, the promotion and you know building the brand of Australian education in Vietnam thank you so much and back to you Aaron Thank you very much, uh, Rebecca Ball from Austrade. And we look forward to uh, seeing that. That was uh, Shine with Australia on VTV7. Uh, next, I'd like to um, uh, introduce our panel discussion for the day. The topic is on the digitization of education. And specifically, we posed the question to the panelists, the digital future challenges for the education sector. We have three panelists and a moderator, and I'd just like to introduce them. Uh, the first panelist is uh, Jane McGee. She is head of school at the United Nations International School in Hanoi. That's UNIS for, for us uh, in the education industry up, up north. Uh, Jane has worked in the K-12 international schools for the past 25 years. She has a Master of Education in Policy and Administration Studies, has served on numerous accreditation teams for the Council of International Schools, that's CIS, and also the New England Association of Schools and Colleges through the region and first presented on K-12 online learning in 2010, based on findings from her school's response to the H1N1 pandemic. The next presenter we have will be Dr. Fan Tinok Dan. She is the director at eLearning Center, Ho Chi Minh City Open University. Dr. Fan is currently the director of Center for eLearning and the secretary of the University Council at Ho Chi Minh City Open University. Dr. Fan holds a PhD in curriculum and instruction from Texas Tech University, USA, and she's interested in online learning, curriculum studies, and school governance. Uh, Mr. Uh, sorry, Dr. Patrick Pheasant is the CEO of Nice Australia. Nice Australia is a global leader in quality assurance for the English language teaching sector. In the role of CEO, Dr. Pheasant brings 25 years of experience in applying drama. TESOL and teacher training methodologies across multiple education sectors around the world. Patrick completed his PhD research at the University of Sydney using process drama in ELT. He's the past director of the University of Sydney Centre for English Teaching, past vice president of the University English Centres of Australia, that's UECA, and past convener of the Nice Advisory Council. And I would also like to introduce the moderator for the session, Mr. Dennis Brunetti. Uh, Dennis Brunetti is president of Ericsson Vietnam, Myanmar, Cambodia and Laos since, since 2017. Prior to his current role, Dennis was country manager of Ericsson in Sri Lanka and the Maldives. Eric has, uh, sorry, Dennis has been involved in the global ICT industry for 30 years, having held leadership positions with Ericsson across a range of countries, including Australia, Sweden, Hong Kong, Sri Lanka and Vietnam. Dennis proudly served as the co-chairman of, of the European Chamber of Commerce in Vietnam in 2018, 2019, as well as co-chair of the Industry 4.0 Advisory Group in the VCCI. Uh, for those of us in Vietnam, Dennis is often in the media as Ericsson will roll out 5G in Vietnam and hopefully solve many of our connectivity problems. Uh, Dennis, uh, over to you. Thanks a lot, Aaron. Just uh, turning on my video, I don't know if you can see me. Um, has that come up? 
It has. I guess it has now, yeah, I can see. <laughs> Good morning, Aaron and Rebecca and everyone uh, attending today's symposium. It's a pleasure to be here and really uh, fun and exciting, actually, to moderate this panel discussion. The three speakers today clearly have extensive experience in, in education, especially in online education. And like all industries we're seeing today, not only due to COVID, but even prior to COVID, I think uh, really undergoing digital transformation and certainly due to COVID-19, accelerating that digital transformation journey. And education is no different to any other industry. And in fact, I'd say education is one of the leading industries that have embraced digital technology. Um, certainly, um, you know, sort of necessity, I guess, is the mother of invention, they say. And in this case, certainly, I think online education has grown in importance because it has become a necessary device, a tool to help people really get through their education and studies in a very proactive, positive way. So it's become more efficient and effective, I think, as a means to, to be educated and to go through that learning journey. So I'd like to start actually with Jane, Jane McGee. I have a question because Jane's been in the industry for over 25 years, international schools. She's had experience obviously in 2010 with the H1N1 pandemic and learnings from that. So Jane, from your experience, what are some of the reflections and some of the learnings you'd like to share with us today, based not only on the COVID experience, of course, but even prior to that uh, in previous pandemics? What, where do you see face-to-face -face versus online uh, learning going, moving forward as a result of those learnings? I, I do feel that there is, um, after having to move to online learning so quickly this time around, last time um, when I was at a school that had to move, it was similar in terms of urgency, but nowhere near the length of time. So the tools have shifted significantly. Um, I do believe though, um, I think my thinking in 2010 would have been that online learning was going to be um, an option that many, many families chose. Um, for children to pursue different pathways, to self-pace, to pursue interests um, and their own real way to work through the standards and expectations that we have. And what we're learning is that um, the face-to-face -face, face -to -face provides different elements in terms of social emotional learning and building connections. Um, that support learning as well. So I think when I, when I look at the future, I think our parents actually, the consumer for lack of a better word, um, get there's more options and they get to choose what's best for their own child and that child's individual needs, whether that's a face-to-face -face brick and mortar um, school environment, whether that's completely online or whether that's a school that takes both and blends them. So we have some classes that might continue always being face-to-face -face and some classes that would be online and some that utilize technology to make that bridge. Over Sorry, to you. Dennis, you got on mute. Sorry. I, I'm, so, I'm finished with my no, response. Right. Yeah. Yeah, great. So I was just asking, have you seen any difference in performance uh, between online learning and face-to-face -face, uh, from students, from your experience? Yeah, I think Vietnam it... And elsewhere? Yeah, I think it. Um, the research is coming out and some of the research indicates that there hasn't been as much learning loss as was expected back in 2020 um, with the shift to online learning and those that um, were exposed to it for longer period of times. But I would personally say it truly depends on the individual child. And then it depends on the strategy of the school, the strategies the school has in place to work with those children and those families there's a spectrum of learners and you, the differentiation doesn't change um, and the needs of those different um, learning styles and, and the needs of those kids don't change just because you're online. So it's adaptable, flexible, and trying to reach an, each and every child, just like when you're face to face. Really yeah, fantastic. Yeah, that's good. It reminds me of the old adage, always best connected. Yeah. So obviously it's always going to be a, a different mix of different types of connectivity, whether it's face to face online and and other things in the future, of course, with virtual reality, augmented reality also kicking in. Um, with regards to Dr. Fan then, Dr. Fan has a, a lot of online experience as well, of course, in, in her role, especially in Ho Chi Minh City, Open University. So Dr. Fan, what are some of your reflections on online learning and virtual studies? And what are those reflections or learnings that you can share with us today, as well as challenges, opportunities and challenges with regards to that? Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Dennis. 
and I would like to share some experience working with online learners, especially Vietnamese learners. Uh, I've been working in this field for more than five years and I realized that uh, Vietnamese students, especially I'm working with adult learners who are currently working both, uh, uh, they work at the same time taking our online programs. So the um, challenge, the basic challenge for them is the time management and how they can manage their work life and the study. And um, regarding the uh, digitalization of education in higher ed, uh, especially in higher ed, I realized that since the COVID-19, uh, Vietnamese students, Vietnamese learners in, at universities, they uh, start to uh, get used to learning online, but uh, somehow it's more uh, about the remote delivery uh, than the uh, truly online learning. I mean, um, swin, uh, since we have to switch immediately from face-to-face uh, -face classroom to the fully online, I mean, uh, full-time working online. So some students encounter challenges, but after one year, I realized that the students at my university, they get used to it. And since we have the uh, learning materials composed for um, online delivery format. You know that uh, I think we should re envision the curriculum for our online learning programs, not just for the adult learners, what I'm in charge of, but also for the mainstream students as well as the K to 12. I'm sorry to talk about K to 12, it's not my major, but since these days in Vietnam, we start to uh, Im implement the fully online for K to 12. So um, the curriculum is one aspect we need to uh, take into consideration as well as the uh, digital uh, divide. It means that um, not all the students, especially from remote areas, provinces, they are not able to afford the devices or the mo more important thing is the uh, teaching and learning methodologies, pedagogies that we need to take into uh, <laughs> considerations very carefully because it may um, influence their future development. But um, if we look into it in a positive way, it, this is a big chance for them to get exposed to uh, the Digital uh, digitalization in education. So uh, there are some points I would like to share with you. Yeah, I fully agree with you, actually, Dr. Fan. In, in terms of the technology itself, that's the enabling platform, of course, or the enabler, but it's not the end game. But uh, clearly, one thing that we have seen and noticed is that with online learning, more students, whether they're in urban areas, rural countryside, or mountainous remote areas, are able to get access to education through uh, digital connectivity. So that's the importance really of the ICT industry in Vietnam and clearly the government, I think, in Vietnam has done a fantastic job really enabling um, the digital transformation of not only education but other industries through that te digital uh, technology like 4G and soon 5G we expect in this country. Um, Dr Fan, also from an international collaboration perspective, where do you see opportunities or do you actually envisage uh, opportunities in partnering with inter international institutions um, in order to create new uh, digital education solutions and experiences? Uh, since we have the decree uh, 39, there's a, a international collaborations in online education. So it op opens a, a new horizon for collaborations and cooperation between the countries, between universities. So our university uh, have been partnered with uh, uh, some international universities, especially Australian uh, universities, for example, um, uh, New South Wales or um, Flinders, uh, Edith Cowan. And uh, recently, in, uh, in terms of online education, we have partnered with uh, an organization, an institution, uh, e, uh, the IPM, the, uh, an online course about project management. And I'm looking forward to have more collaborations with Australian institutions and university too. Uh, the, the course that I mentioned were, uh, was implemented in our VMOOCs. Uh, that is the Vietnam um, Massive Open Online Courses for Vietnamese learners. 
and uh, recently the statistics shows that that course was uh, accessed by uh, a lot of uh, Vietnamese learners. So this is a good signal, a good signal for us to have more chance to operate not just for the short term courses, but also for the online uh, degree like bachelor or master degrees in the future. And uh, our university is one of the uni five university piloting a project between the US government and the Ministry of Education and Training of Vietnam. So hopefully we will uh, have more uh, chance and corporations in the future. Sure, very good. Thank you, Dr. Fan. Um, over to Dr. Patrick. And Dr. Patrick, you have over 25 years experience as well in the education industry and uh, using drama to teach English. How do you see um, the use of drama in teaching English from, a, from an online engagement of students moving forward? You know, good question. And of, of course you can imagine uh, someone like myself who, you know, is very hands-on and, and uses uh, such a technique like uh, drama to teach English. You can imagine my horror when uh, everyone had to go online and, uh, and actually try and teach English, uh, you know, through the, through the camera. Um, but look, what I've seen uh, over the last 12 months is, a, you know, a really rapid transformation um, uh, from, um, you know, people moving to remote teaching very quickly, trying to replicate their physical class, you know, in the online space to really rethinking, uh, you know, how they should uh, teach online and also be rethinking who they are actually teaching. So you've got to bear in mind our students are actually going to be working in a global workforce that's probably going to be most virtual. I mean, uh, one kind of offshoot of COVID is that the whole world has gone virtual. And I, I don't think we're going to go backwards, you know, virtual uh, teaching and learning and virtual working is, is really here to stay. It may not be, you know, 100% of our time, but certainly it's going to be a big part of our time. So it totally makes sense that we're actually teaching uh, people, young children and kids, how to communicate online and how to connect with other people uh, through uh, digital technologies. And so for me, making that uh, transformation um, and using drama techniques uh, in online teaching, I was really about um, uh, thinking, you know, what are ways that we can engage students virtually? How can we reach out to them, keep them engaged, not just academically engaged, but emotionally engaged? And, you know, using art forms, using uh, dance, drama, uh, uh, and our other visual arts, other art forms, is a really great way to, to keep people connected. And I think you can do that um, in the online space as well. So uh, I haven't lost hope. There's still uh, still uh, some really great stuff being done uh, with, with people in the online space, using role play, using improvisation, handing over some of the control to students in the online classrooms, giving them a sense of empowerment to practice situations in, a, in as realistically as they possibly can for their future uh, work. And their future work is going to be online as a global citizen. So um, yeah, some of um, the previous um, uh, speakers, my colleagues in this panel have kind of already talked to, it's um, really thinking about uh, how to design good quality curriculum, how to make sure that, you know, you're still able to assess students online in an appropriate way, taking advantage of the technology rather than looking at it as a, as a kind of a, an inhibitor or a deficit. That's very good. And, and what innovations have you seen in online delivery of English language uh, lessons and education? Yeah, well, look, NIAS, the organisation I work for, we, we have over 100 organisations that are quality assured by us. And, uh, you know, many of them are high schools, are um, uh, vocational education providers, universities, and also completely online providers. And, you know, everyone's had the opportunity to move online in the last 12 months. And uh, we've been surveying um, hundreds of students uh, throughout that entire 12 months, talking to them about their expectations with their online experience and comparing that to the teacher's um, uh, expectations. Um, so there's, um, 
there's some really strong gaps there with um, with what the students are experiencing and what the teachers are saying they are delivering. Um, but but reassuringly, those gaps have really closed over the last uh, 12 months. And that's because, you know, teachers have got better at, at, at delivering uh, things online. The providers have got better with the technology and the students have actually got better with participating uh, with, with uh, online activities. But you know what? The one thing that hasn't uh, got better. In fact, it's got worse over the last 12 months is students' expectations. Their expectations have gone up. They actually want a really engaging, amazing online experience. And we've got to continuously evolve, continuously transform to deliver that to them. So even though uh, the um, the, the reporting systems, the uh, delivery systems, the, the mechanisms that we're using uh, to deliver English language teaching online are improving. Students' expectations are going up much faster. So it's a, it's a bit of a race. We've got to keep ahead, keep ahead. ahead of the students and really help them, um, you know, uh, uh, help the teachers deliver to the student expectations. So. Um, some great things that we've seen amongst our centres, uh, we've seen um, some virtual excursions being used, we've seen lots of guest speakers uh, being included, we've seen involvement of all of the stakeholders in the ELT community coming into the online space, so this might be education agents, it might be involving, um, you know, parents, uh, uh, all of those, uh, you know, support mechanisms for students, bringing those into the online space and, uh, you know, uh, sharing that space. Because um, it, it's, you know, it can be hard being on Zoom for 20 hours a week. Uh, uh, it's, you know, it's hard being on Zoom for two hours, um, let alone 20 hours. So it's really about trying to provide diverse diversity, really different types of experience for different types of learn learners. And, you know, it, it's about going back to, you know, that kind of back to the basics really of, of creating great programs for a variety of students so people can be engaged in their learning and can be practicing real life or true uh, um, activities that they're going to be using, you know, in their workplace or, or in their higher education space. No, that's very good reflections, actually. And I was going to ask all of you, actually, just one question in relation to the humanness aspect. Um, psychologically and, and as human beings, we have that need for physical interaction. Um, how have you seen that evolve? And uh, do you see any negative impact uh, in that regard when it comes to the increased use of online education? I'll start with you, Patrick, then I'll go to Jane and yeah. Dr. Ben. Look, I don't think anyone is saying that everything should be done 100% online. And, and I, I don't hear anybody saying that everyone is maintaining that there needs to be uh, a human connection somewhere in the, in the, in the experience. So uh, I think it's, uh, you know, we're, NIAS, we're using a, a term globalization uh, and talking about uh, how important it is to be making partnerships with, um, with other providers and other organizations around the world. So if you are teaching students in, um, say, an Australian organisation is teaching students in Vietnam, they've got partnerships in place so those students in Vietnam can have the Australian online experience but can also meet then face-to-face -face with other students who are studying or other um, mentors or other, um, uh, um, other international students to have that uh, you know, physical uh, uh, connection and that human interaction. That said, there's some great transformation happening online. Testing is becoming uh, more thorough online. Um, uh, virtual reality is really rapidly transforming. So, you know, I think, uh, I, I think we're seeing massive changes, but I think we'll always go back to that, that kind of element of education, which is we want to connect with one another. And uh, you know how do we how do we set systems in place that allow that to happen? Yeah, very good. Thanks, Patrick. Jane, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I want to just jump on um, Patrick's comment about putting the systems in place. What we've found um, with the the early years to twelfth grade students is sometimes we have to help facilitate that. So, in our classroom environment online, are we ensuring that? the connections in breakout rooms are intentional and where there's interest, especially the start of the school year, are there um, ice, like connections put into place where kids learn how to connect online. It, it's teaching them how to do that when they maybe don't know who they're speaking with. 
Um, so they can build that connection, which then creates the rapport and builds the social connection for the future. Um, I, I also agree with what Patrick said. This is a reality. Our, our, our children who will be adults one day are going to need to know how to navigate this environment and learn how to create meaningful relationships professionally and personally um, in virtually. Um, so it's just a great, uh, a great um, way to be teaching it um, now. Fantastic. Thanks, Jane. And Dr. Fan, your thoughts and reflections? Uh, regarding the uh, social presence in online learning, I, I would like to share in uh, the, uh, the view of uh, adult learners. Uh, we uh, offer uh, fully online programs for distance education, but uh, for the mainstream students, we only uh, have the blended mode because we believe that the social presence is very important to help the students, especially who just graduated from high school to improve their social skill. Uh, but for the distant learners, we also need to help to improve their uh, social uh, interaction. Like besides the um, uh, taking the fully online the, uh, with the contents of the programs, we try to offer the extracurriculum activities for example, we have end of the semester meeting with the deans or uh, with the, uh, the uh, director board of the universities, or we have some seminars, or the final exam because of the regulations in Vietnam, the students still have to go to uh, campus for the final exams, but these days has changed a lot. We move on to online testing, but uh, uh, previous months, we have the students to come to school for the final exams and they have a chance to meet together. And also mm -hmm. in order to improve the, the social in, uh, presence in online classes, we have different forums and uh, 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 interaction channels for them to communicate. And the breakout rooms are a good way for us to facilitate the interaction the communications among the students when we teach. Fantastic. Thank you. We've got a few minutes left. So what I'll do is um, put you on the spot. Uh, one minute each. Just give me a, a view, give the audience a view of where you see the industry going, uh, the learning education industry moving forward with the utilisation of uh, technology, digital transformation over the coming years. Over to you. First, I'll start with Jane, just for one minute each. What's your crystal ball gazing into the future look like? I think there's going to be a lot more choice. Um, in um, early childhood to the grade 12 education where parents can pick and choose what they want for their children based on mm -hmm. the needs of that individual child. Is it online? Is it blended? Is it face-to-face? -face? And a brick and mortar traditional school is probably going to have to move more towards a blended to increase opportunities for all students. Very, very nicely done. Thank you, Jane. Uh, Dr. Fan? Um, I would like to add my... Uh opinion in regarding this, I think um, the uh, online education, we have more opportunities, especially for the adult learners, especially after COVID-19. Uh, I realized that the number of the enrollments in our online programs has been great. Even the economy yeah, the may economy encounter some difficulties, but they still want to take online programs because it's just uh, a preparation for the change after uh, everything getting to a new normal map. A normal mod less. So I see a bright horizon for online education. Yes. Very good. Thank you. And Dr. Patrick, over to you. Um, yeah, look, I think we're going to see um, a, a real, um, well, a continued transformation of uh, uh, teaching for the entire uh, breadth of the student experience, starting from very, very uh, young, uh, right through to their, their work and throughout their, their workplace. So I think it's about, um, I, I really keep, keep on saying it's about partnerships because, you know, we're going to see um, a real shift in where English language teaching is occurring around the world. I think it's going to start much earlier um, in some of these um, traditionally sourced countries for Australia, for example. I see some amazing stuff being done in Vietnam and with our indoor centres there and with teacher training. So I, I think it's about partnerships. We're going to see really fantastic partnerships occurring that allow students to tap into, uh, you know, uh, constant improvement and constant learning throughout their entire um, uh, life. Uh, so I, I think that's through partnerships. 
Um, and uh, also, I think we're going to see a, a real change in um, in teacher training as well. And look, I'd like to invite you all actually to attend some workshops that we're, we're doing for teacher training and online delivery. Um, and that's supported by um, by the Department of Foreign Trade and Affairs Australia. So um, I'll shoot the uh, the URL in the in the chat. Please join us uh, for that. Uh, and we'll be talking more about um, online delivery and teacher training. So, um, yeah, I, I think we're up for, for some still rapid a change um, but I think it's going to be really positive and it's going to be about about partnerships international partnerships. fantastic and I know we've just run out of time and I there were a lot of questions coming through but we've got limited time unfortunately and uh, we're having to wrap it up but I really want to touch on that point actually partnerships and collaboration I think uh, Auscham and the Australian Embassy and obviously all the universities and institutions involved in this symposium have done a great job in partnering and collaborating and bringing this to us today so thank you and yesterday of course as well so thank you all very much. Uh, it's been a great uh, session and I enjoy looking forward to actually meeting most of you, hopefully face to face sometime soon. Back to you, Aaron. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dennis. Thank you, panelists. And, and apologies, folks. Uh, I see that there are some questions that are just coming in now. We'll, we'll try and um, follow some of those up uh, uh, towards the end in the um, uh, audience engagement session if we have time for that. Um, folks, we have a short break coming up. Um, just after the break, we have three separate um, presenters who will each be um, talking for 10 minutes. Um, but I'd just like to highlight that during the break, if you could please put your thoughts or comments of the symposium into the chat function, that would be really great for us. Um, for now, we're just going to have a few minutes break. Uh, go and get a drink, go, go to the bathroom or make yourself comfortable again. And we'll be back uh, uh, again at uh, um, uh, just at 10.30. Uh, Well, I think I'm very lucky to be posted to Vietnam right at this moment because our relationship is so broad. Um, it covers every aspect of a bilateral relationship that you can think of, from our strategic partnership, which reflects the fact that Vietnam is becoming an increasingly important strategic partner for us in the Indo-Pacific region, and we share an interest in building a stable and prosperous region. Um, so there's um, that aspect of the relationship. And then you run right across every aspect you can think of through defence and security cooperation to economic and trade cooperation, which is particularly important at the moment as we look towards the future of Vietnam in the post-COVID environment. And then elements like education, which has always been the bedrock of our relationship with Vietnam. And again, that's all about people. It's about allowing Vietnamese students to go to Australia to study and increasingly for Australians to come here as well. And that builds understanding, it builds partnership, and it builds the future of the relationship. We also have some really interesting aspects of our engagement um, with Vietnam. Uh, we have a lot of agriculture and agricultural research, which has been a long-standing feature of the relationship. And in more recent years, we've focused on knowledge and innovation. And that really is where we're starting to look towards the future of the relationship and really focus on what the next generation of Australians and Vietnamese have got to give to each other and give to the relationship. And I might just say how encouraging and how exciting it's been for me to come back and be the ambassador when the relationship looks like that because I've seen the journey from 25 years ago and more to the point that we reached today. When I first worked here um, in Vietnam in the early 1990s, we had a good, strong, long-standing partnership and relationship which was just starting to enter education and was building on our development partnership and many other aspects, but it has progressed so far in the last 25 years. And to be leading such a diverse and broad relationship is a real privilege. And it says a lot to me about the wonderful partnership that we have. It's based on a long period of time. We've been with Vietnam from the very beginning. And so we have continuity, we have history. What is your view of uh, Vietnamese students' uh, capabilities? Uh, what are the pros and cons, and how how does that help them get into one of the you know prestigious Australian universities? I, I think Vietnamese students are dynamic. They're, they're highly motivated. One of the things I have to learn when they go to Australia is having critical thinking. So I'm sure here in Vietnam, a lot of the schools you, you learn by rote. So you just learn by heart. 
we're in Australia, we, we want you to challenge. We want you to challenge what you learn. We want you to learn by yourself. So we'll encourage you to go out there and, and read books, watch videos, talk to people, immerse yourself in the community, and you'll learn a lot more. Yeah. We won't give you all the answers. We want you to find the answer. Mm. And I think that's one of the challenges for Vietnamese students, that they've been so used to being told the answer, mm -hmm. and we're, we're asking you to, to go find the answer. Mm -hmm. When you go to school in Australia, that's one of the things we'll ask you. What, what's good and bad about this book? What's yeah. good and bad about this article? If you only give the good, you'll only get 30 or 40%. We want you to actually tell us the bad parts about it, or how could it be improved? Yeah. That's, why we're getting, that's what Australian education is all about. How can things improve? Challenge the, challenge the norm yeah. and get more out of it. Uh, I don't think um, Vietnamese students, their grammar is too shabby, but why are they having so, so many issues with speaking? True. So I think they, they learn grammar so well and by rote at university and at high school that, that speaking isn't natural. And, and I have advice, and a great friend of mine who is a, a leading uh, educationalist in, in English language mm. said he has three big tips wow. for students to pick up how to speak better English. And the first big tip is to practice. <laughs> and the second biggest tip is to practice. And the third most important tip I is to figure. practice. <laughs> so, and I think just students have to have the confidence to, to speak more uh, and their English language mm -hmm. will, will, will improve. And uh, who is this um, expert friend of yours? Actually, a great friend from Australia, Patrick Pheasant. Um, yeah. He uh, looks after one of the leading accreditation bodies in Australia, NIAS. Um, I think he's joining us on the show today. Yeah. Patrick Pheasant. How hey, are you, Patrick? Patrick? Hi, Tom. Hi, Philip. So, Patrick and I have just discussed uh, a few problems that Vietnamese students, or international students for that matter, may have in improving their communication skills. Do you have any suggestions for them? Yeah, look, that's a, that's a good question. And, you know, I think learning English, it's a lifelong journey, right? Um, uh, it's about uh, doing things uh, in English and studying English hard, but it's also about making mistakes and being brave and being courageous. You know, if you keep on trying and trying again in English, you're certainly going to improve. So I think uh, learning English is a, a lifelong journey uh, and you should always think about what you can improve on and where you can go with your future language learning study. And may I Welcome back everybody. They were just some uh, short clips from the VTV7 uh, channel uh, that you can watch uh, coming up from Austrag. Uh, next, we have three short presentations on the topic of partnerships between institutions in Australia and Vietnam. Each will go for 10 minutes. What I'd like to do is introduce the speakers uh, one by one. So I'll introduce one speaker, and then at the end of that, uh, their, their 10 minutes, I'll introduce the, the second speaker and so forth. The first speaker, uh, Ian Wilson, is from the secondary sector. Ian is director of the Albert Einstein School. Ian has qualifications in education, education administration and law. He is a 2002 Churchill Fellow. He has over 40 years experience in school education in roles that include classroom teacher, principal, K-6, K-10, K-12 and secondary schools, director of schools and district superintendent in New South Wales, Australia. Currently, he is director of Albert Einstein School, the private Vietnamese early years to grade 12 school in Ho Chi Minh. This school has recently established an international senior secondary pathway through the Victoria Certificate of Education. Welcome, Ian. Through the Victoria Certificate of Education. Welcome, Ian. Thank you, Aaron. Albert Einstein School is a campus of the Canadian International School System here in Ho Chi Minh. And uh, it is one of the three campuses. The other, the difference between Albert Einstein School, uh, next slide please, and, um, and the uh, other schools in the, the Canadian International School System is that Albert Einstein School is a Vietnamese private school and also runs a, um, a uh, intensive English program, English as a second language program from early years through to grade 12. So next slide, please. <clears throat> as the uh, slide suggests uh, and the title suggests, Albert Einstein School has 
branched out, or the owners of the Canadian International School System have branched out to deliver a Australian secondary credential. And that secondary credential is international in its scope. It's, and this, uh, this is done through uh, the, the uh, partnership of Haleberry School in Melbourne, Victoria. So a little bit of background there. We're a private Vietnamese school, about 950 students. And we go through to uh, develop students with a, an English capability in grade 12 of anywhere between C, C1, B, B to C1 standard in the um, Common European Framework or in IELTS, around about six to uh, eight as their uh, capability. Now, the school is uh, international staff, really staff, and also Australian for students and parents to make a choice after grade 10 of whether they want to achieve an international secondary school credential or whether they want to continue with the Moat Vietnamese diploma. So the next slide, please, shows that in diagram diagrammatic form that we run the Vietnamese program to grade, end of grade 10. And in our, in our, English, in our English program, that's the above the Vietnamese English, we actually have some bridging capability to enable students to be able to um, participate in the VCE and start to develop that critical thinking skills, which was mentioned by, by um, our friend from NIS yesterday, uh, Mr. Pheasant, about the fact that learning in an, an Australian context is something quite different to the Vietnamese uh, requirements. So our, our next slide goes on to uh, talk a little bit about the, um, the fact that Victoria Global, an enterprise of the Victorian government, has moved offshore to establish the Victorian government industry and partnerships across the world. And it's been focusing heavily on Southeast Asia. Um, if I go particularly to the uh, VCE, the VCE has been uh, enabled to be able to be delivered in an offshore mode. So that's outside of Australia. So the legislative body, the Victorian Curriculum Assessment Authority, allowed the VCE to be studied under two timetables and has a global international secondary school credential. It has a Southern Hemisphere timetable for Australian schools and those schools that are offshore in the Southern Hemisphere. And it has the same for the Northern Hemisphere. And Vietnam operates on that Northern Hemisphere timetable. The difference between the two timetables is that the start of the school year, as you would know, the Northern Hemisphere timetable starts around about August, September and finishes in May, June. The, south, uh, the Southern Hemisphere starts generally around January, end of January, and goes to the end of the school year, which is around about December. Now, the VCE is equivalent, has the same status as the IB, the Cambridge A-levels, the US SAT and AP tests. So what you've got is Victoria through Victoria Global starting to spread its wings and produce a, a means for this uh, credential be, to be um, acquired. And then the next thing that's needed is firstly, the, the school to be able to do that and have the capability. So the Vietnamese uh, government and Moat have enabled under degree 86 um, integrated partnerships, which allow offshore credentials 
to be studied at a Vietnamese school. Okay, so that means that um, you need a foreign partner to do that. And that's where Haleberry comes in. If we go to the next slide, please. No. We, the Haleberry School has a reputation in Australia of being a very reputable independent school, but its vision is to become a world school. And it has programs in China based on the Northern Hemisphere timetable of the VCE. It has offshore programs in China, the Philippines and East Timor. And our school, AES, is the first program, VCE program for Vietnam. And it's a private partnership and contract with Haleberry School. And as I've mentioned, you need the licensing capability and approval th through the Vietnamese MOA. That license and approval has to be then approved by the, uh, the VCAA as the school being an offshore site to deliver the VCE and having the necessary standards to do that. And those standards mean instructional delivery, assessment processes, because any credential, international credential, is quite uh, detailed in its rules to ensure uh, quality and integrity of the, of the um, credential. So uh, Haleberry then go on in their partnership to support, not only does it establish, help to establish the program, but it supports the program at the offshore school. And it does that in a way which is quite particular. So in other words, every teacher that we have employed in the program here in Vietnam has an individual mentor in, at Haleberry School in, um, in Melbourne. So that teacher is in contact sometimes daily, but generally each week at a minimum uh, to support and to provide advice on teaching. So there's monitoring via video connection and, and uh, other uh, uh, remote uh, observation techniques. And our teachers here also rely on the advice of very high performing professional staff from Haleberry. Haleberry also provide a, a, de a de professional development annually and uh, teacher networks across the schools in China, the Philippines and East Timor. So there is also certification of the teachers to participate in this program. So Haleberry ensure to the VCAA that the standard of delivery is um, enough to be able to meet what you would call the standard of delivery in a normal, normal uh, Victorian school. So, um, the other thing that's really important about this program, uh, the VCE, it isn't the VTEC program. So uh, in terms of a vocational uh, pathway, it is a academic program, highly academic program. And Haleberry aims to, to have Vietnamese students here um, achieve ATARs in the, in the um, from the 70s up to the uh, 90s to be able to uh, seek placement in the top uh, eight students, uh, uh, universities in Australia, but also globally. And the way Haleberry do that is that they provide um, access to a limited range of subjects in the VCE. So we're, we're talking about English, which is mandatory in the VCE, and then you have math methods. They offer, can offer specialized maths, which is, is the highest level of maths in the VCE. They offer physics and chemistry. All of those subjects, all of those subjects are high scoring subjects in the ATAR. Can I have the next slide, please? And um, we had our first year last year in this program and three out of our 16 students in grade 12, and they'd only done grade 12, they'd only done grade 12 for 12 months. They didn't do the, the grade 11 year uh, because of COVID. We, um, and 
parents were bringing students back from Canada and America and Australia and Europe, they sought um, enrollment in the VCE to be able to continue their grade 12 without having to repeat or go back and do another grade 11 to do grade, uh, do the IB or Cambridge or A-levels or whatever. So what happened was our students on one year tuition did extremely well in the VCE program. So there are some advantages for being able to deliver uh, the Vietnamese um, in, within a Vietnamese context, Vietnamese private school context, the, uh, the Australian VCE credential. So it allows that option or choice as a pathway in the last two years. On a social aspect, it allows students to remain with their family rather than go overseas and live. Um, at a younger age, they can stay with their family until they reach the age of 18 or end of grade 12, and then end with a, an international credential. It's a, what you would say a cheaper option because there's no travel costs or accommodation costs or there are student fees which are cheaper than they are in Australia. But the, um, the situation is a, a more economically advantageous option for parents. It does allow entry into Vietnamese universities and all our students gained access to uh, last year to either Viet um, Vietnamese universities, RMIT, or other un international universities in Ho Chi Minh, or they went offshore to America, Canada, or to Australia. And it is an international credential, so the whole program is taught in English. And the other really important part about the, uh, the program is that it, it focuses on the strengths of Vietnamese students. Vietnamese students are very capable in mathematics, in physics and chemistry. They're also very capable in Vietnamese as a first language. So those subjects are offered to, in our VCE program and that will enable our students to maximise their ATAR score. So next slide just shows some takeaways from this uh, small talk of what we're doing. Okay, we need to have, or you need to have, if you want to consider this, a pathway option at grade 10. You need to have um, quality, a quality English as a second language acquisition program up to grade 10. So when the students go to the VCE, which is in totally in, in um, English, they can understand the more difficult concepts in physics and chemistry and their writing um, and their development of a, a, a critical view is, is done in a bridging way to be able to be successful at the VCE. You need to meet the licensing requirements. You need to have a partnership under those licensing requirements and that gives you the permission to do the VCE program. Uh, one aspect of the delivery of the program in, in Vietnam is having quality and appropriately qualified staff. Now, I'll, I can talk a little bit more about that in the present in the uh, panel discussion. And the other thing is meeting the requirements of the, uh, of the standards for the facilities, the science laboratories and examination rooms and security and license. So that's about it. Um, I'm available for uh, a comment or further discussion as we go along. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you, Ian. Uh, we'll, we'll welcome any questions at the end, but now I'd like to introduce uh, Jenny Den from the vocational sector. Jenny is General Manager, International Education and Global Engagement from Chisholm Institute in Melbourne, Australia. She oversees the International Education and Global Partnerships. On behalf of Chisholm Institute, her qualifications include a Master of Enterprise, and a grad certificate of management in international education. Jenny is an experienced executive in both commercial and overseas development assistance, predominantly in the vocational education sector with over 20 years background. Uh, Jenny, over to you. Fantastic. Thank you, Aaron, and, thank and welcome everyone. Xing Chao and, and good morning. I'm attending today from my home office in Melbourne, Australia, and I'm very excited to be able to talk to you about vocational education partnerships with Vietnam. I'm just going to share my um, presentation with you. Excellent. Can everyone see that? <laughs> Hope so. That's good. 
Excellent. Um, I've been involved in many projects across the world and, and I was reflecting last night actually about how much the Australian vocational training approach really does suit Vietnamese students. Um, I think it really does suit their, the environment and the learning style um, uh, for, uh, that they have. Uh, very briefly, I, I wanted to just provide a bit of background on Chisholm. We're a large government owned but independently operated vocational education institution in Melbourne, Australia. And we deliver a broad range of vocational and technical skills training, as well as higher education qualifications to over 30,000 students each year. Internationally, we have 14 educational partnerships currently delivering Australian qualifications to around three and a half thousand students with many more in the pipeline. As a way of explaining the, the benefits of partnerships with Australian VET providers, I'm going to present some information to you today on a, a major TVET pro project that we were involved in with our partners AIC in Vietnam in supporting DVET. The program was designed to support the rapid reform of the VET sector in Vietnam to meet economic growth. The key objectives being institutional capacity and international qualifications, which then led to supporting industry with work ready and competent employees. The project commenced in 2013 and has undertaken several steps from the initial scoping through to trial implementation, which was conducted between 2018 and 2019, with graduations taking place for the majority of colleges in January 2020. We we're very, very lucky to have those completed prior to travel restrictions. There were 12 streams of Australian qualifications developed for the program based on key industry workforce needs. These were across a broad range of qualifications as seen here. Qualifications were developed in these industry sectors ranging from certificate three level through to advanced diploma level. Reflecting on the college and teacher outcomes, there are now 25 vocational Vietnam colleges that have the capacity and experience uh, to deliver internationally recognised Australian qualifications with the teaching facilities and equipment in the 12 streams identified meeting international standards. So as Ian said before, it is about making sure that there is facilities and equipment that meet the requirements of the Australian qualifications. There are also 350 teachers across Vietnam that were trained in both the Australian vocational qualification as well as the certificate for in training and assessment, which is a mandatory requirement for delivering and assessing Australian uh, vocational qualifications. Majority of these trainers undertook this development in Australia between 2014 and 2017. These internationally qualified teachers have all developed their professional knowledge of competency-based training, which I think you've heard a few times over the last couple of days, training that is designed to meet the needs of the industry employers and ensure students are work ready. There's student-focused teaching methodology and practice. There's transparent and consistent assessment processes where students know what and how they are to be assessed, are provided with feedback, uh, enabling them to improve their skills and knowledge. The assessment system also enables teachers to keep monitoring a student's learning progress and devise a program that meets meet each, each student's individual learning needs. And also, as, as Jimmy mentioned this morning, that there's educational compliance and audits and how these practices contribute to continuous improvement of teaching and assessing practices. So one of the great advantages of this program is these teachers not only have the international qualifications to deliver Australian qualifications, but they have the benefit of cultural awareness and language to support the Vietnamese students effectively. So with regards to the, the DVET program, we initially enrolled 786 students in February 2018, of which there was a total of 725 graduates. Um, now, this is a completion rate of 93%, which I found really outstanding, considering that this was a new approach to learning, so very unfamiliar to the students, 
but also had the, uh, the added complication of a foreign language as well. So many of the students that I spoke to were, were um, very ready in the first few months to drop out. But fortunately, with our Australian mentors' uh, guidance and support, they continued on. And to finish with a 93% retention is, I think, fantastic. Um, and as of July 2020, we're able to confirm that 580 of those graduates have, have um, found um, employment and uh, or are undertaking further, further studies. So with interviews um, with college rectors and the trainers as well, the Australian mentors, uh, it was noted that the students attained the following skills, which are highly regarded by industry. And these have been touched on a few times as well by other speakers. There's the improvement in English. There's the communication skills. So their ability to ask questions, critically listen to answers, and also to you know, create their own understanding and, and resolutions. There's um, the very integral problem solving skills. So students have developed their abilities to find solutions, to resolve unforeseen problems and are more confident when presented with unknown issues or situations. And then there's also self-direction in learning. So students have gained that understanding of how important it is to take control of their own learning and therefore becoming more disciplined and independent. And it was noted too that uh, there was definitely an improved confidence in our graduates. One of the shared goals of the project was to support students to gain employment or undertake further study. So in order for that to take place, we did initiate some additional activities to support the students. Um, in terms of information uh, regarding pathways to further study, both in Vietnam and offshore, because I think many of you may know that vocational studies are a good pathway to progress to higher education, um, which, is, uh, which is the case in, in Australia. We introduced students to international student agencies so that they had direct access to information and support to study abroad and providing memberships with services such as Going Global, where they could look for offshore work or study opportunities. We also organised panel discussions across Vietnam, which included uh, Navigos recruitment, industry reps such as Hannikins and Bosch Engineering, as well as IDP International. We also provided additional support with employability skills, including career development program, which was about employability and career readiness. We also delivered a workplace preparation program, which focused on uh, relevant work skills like negotiation skills, customer service, teamwork, problem solving. Um, communication was also very important. We provided information direct to students via a private Facebook site. Um, and made sure that they were engaged and connected and building professional networks. Uh, we also promoted the DVET program through AusCham to ensure foreign organisations were aware of the graduates that were coming. So I'm pleased to say that many of the students that were employed were with big foreign direct investment employers such as Foxconn, uh, Hannikins, LG and Samsung. And I know that many of our graduates also picked up leadership roles with um, some of these firms. Uh, industry benefits, all of which uh, these items led to the final objective, which is to support industry meet, meeting the needs of economic expansion. So partner colleges now in Vietnam are able to deliver specialist training programs, programs that provide skills training in the workplace, have trainers that are up to date with industry needs, um, can undertake assessment practices that reflect industry requirements and have improved English proficiency. We've received to date some fantastic feedback from industry about the graduates. And uh, as you can see here, here's one of those from LG. And I guess um, many of you may wanna know where to from here. So currently due to COVID, there's been uh, a delay in recommencing our programs, but we are working with many of the colleges at present and hope to be able to offer these programs again next year. And like everyone else who's spoken at this symp symposium, our delivery of transnational programs have had to adapt to the current online environment, as well as our support and validation of our programs in country. So thank you very much. I appreciate this was a very broad overview and compressed into a very short time frame, um, but hope that it helps you to see some of the, the benefits of partnering with Australian vocational colleges. And I certainly encourage you to look at our website if you want some more information. Come on. Thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, I'd like to now um, ask uh, Professor Mark Turner uh, for the third of the three presentations on partnerships between institutions in Australia and Vietnam. Uh, 
Professor Turner is Deputy Head of the School of Agriculture and Food Sciences at the University of Queensland. He teaches food microbiology, food safety, and food biotechnology at UQ and leads a research team on these topics. Mark has delivered alumni talks and workshops and co-organized conferences in Vietnamese universities and assisted in the establishment of a collabor collaborative master's program. Welcome, Mark. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Um, and thanks, Oscham, for the opportunity to speak um, at this uh, symposium. I'm really enjoying the talks as well. Um, so I just want to, um, I guess, just give you a brief um, overview of where the University of Queensland uh, is regarding uh, engagement and partnerships with, with Vietnam uh, in education, training and also research. Um, so I'm based here in Brisbane, in sunny Queensland, and we've got University of Queensland has three campuses um, and, uh, um, and located in the southeast corner. Um, so we're a research intensive uh, university. Um, and globally ranked around the 50 mark uh, internationally and uh, depending on which ranking system you use. Um, we have around 55,000 students uh, with 20,000 20, or more international and a large proportion of these are postgraduate students, have around uh, 7,000 staff and a large amount of alumni and, and in Vietnam as well. Um, sorry. Um, so we have a lot of engagement with uh, international institutions, uh, over 450 partners across 56 countries, and, and obviously one of these is Vietnam. Um, so the UQ Vietnam engagement, uh, UQ, Vietnam is one of 11 priority countries uh, that UQ has in its global strategy. And this provides uh, opportunities with uh, support for developing uh, relationships with these countries, with uh, funding and so on provided by UQ to initiate and, and build on uh, uh, partnerships. Um, and we certainly look at uh, the, the commonalities between Vietnam's economic and communi uh, community development priorities with UQ's diverse research interests. And, and we have particular strength in areas or engagement with areas like agriculture and food safety, science and technology, uh, digital transformation and public health. Uh, we have based in, we have a UQ staff member based in Hanoi and she's part of the UQ Global Engagement and Entrepreneurship uh, Department. And her role there is really to um, assist with engagement with universities, government, uh, corporate networks, uh, NGOs, and also supporting alumni in Vietnam. Um, so we have a lot of agreements with Vietnamese uh, partners um, uh, with 17 different uh, institutions in Vietnam. Uh, we have around, in the last five years, we've had 500 uh, Vietnamese students uh, study with UQ. Around 85 of those have been sponsored. Um, and in Vietnam, we have over 1,200 um, alumni there. Um, so just talking about some research projects first. So we have um, a lot of research uh, going on with Vietnam in, in the last five years. There's been over $9 million worth of research projects uh, involving UQ and Vietnamese uh, partners. Um, and a lot of these have been in agriculture and, and, and mostly funded by ACR, the Australian uh, Centre for International Agriculture Research, ACR uh, grants, um, but also funded by the Vietnamese um, government as well. And these are in areas like rice and maize and so on. Um, we publish a lot of uh, research um, with co-authored with Vietnamese researchers, and, and this is great to, to um, collaborate and, and build up the Vietnamese um, research strengths in the country there as well. Um, and we have four projects that, which have been funded for UQ to initiate new um, research projects. Uh, we do international development, which involves Vietnamese um, participants as well. So we have an international development um, uh, section at UQ and looking at to develop um, uh, activities, workshops and so on in the Asia Pacific region. And, and so two of the workshops that we've recently run in 2020 and 2018 um, were funded by um, uh, DFAT and OSFOR Skills, looking at, um, uh, there's one here on workshop and women led SMEs and another one with governance and leadership in universities involving several universities. And these workshops um, supported the, the training of, of uh, in Vietnam. Um, just briefly, as a, before I finish, is we just want to talk briefly about the area that I'm from, which is food science and technology. Um, and we've got uh, joint programs with uh, Nong Lum University in Ho Chi Minh City. Over many years, we've had a, a close collaboration with them. We have a two plus two year articulation bachelor of food technology program and a one plus one masters. Um, and this is where the students will do two years in, in Vietnam in, Ho Chi, in, in Nong Lum University and then come to UQ to do the other two years. 
and likewise with the one year in, in, in Vietnam and then one year at UQ with the Masters. Um, and this is where we signed the, the, the Masters with the president of Nong Lam University, uh, Professor Hay, um, a few years ago. Um, we've also been involved in a lot of conferences. This is one that I was involved in, with, which, which was around sustainable agriculture and the environment with Nong Lam University. And this is the UQ people there. This is our, uh, our Vietnamese um, UQ um, representative that is based in uh, Hanoi. Uh, Chi, and this this conference involved the collaboration between Nong Lam University of Queensland and a Japanese university as well, Okayama University, and this is all the participants. Um, we've done a lot of uh, uh, visits and professional development seminars and workshops over the years. Um, this was one I did in 2013 on food safety, and 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 this is myself with the uh, uh, Pro Vice Chancellor for International Engagement, Alan Lawson. Um, and we visited three cities and three universities um, in, uh, in, in a week. And I gave uh, workshops on, on food safety. And this is the sixth one of this. They run them every year and other topics like public health and um, business and so on. They bring in, uh, we brought out experts from um, different areas um, to run these um, uh, professional development seminars. We've also done a lot of visiting talks and workshops and myself and others uh, in, in food science, but also a lot of other areas, visit universities. And uh, this was Denang University of Technology and, and Gang University in Kanto, um, not too long ago before COVID. And also alumni events as well. So UQ obviously wants to maintain a close relationship with alumni. We have a lot of UQ graduates now that are leaders in, in, in Vietnam in various areas. So we like to engage with them whenever we can. This was one in uh, Ho Chi Minh City. Um, so the opportunities we see from UQ is, is obviously we're doing all these things at the moment um, and we see this continuing to grow. So partnering with Vietnamese universities to deliver online and offshore programs, articulation programs and joint training programs. Um, more research with, with uh, universities and institutions in Vietnam. Um, partnering with industry bodies in the private sector, which is probably not something we have, have done in the past, but I see this as an area that will grow in the future. Um, Australian government funding projects, so for, for, de for development and training, um, but also for research. And then more engagement with the Vietnamese government bodies, so Moat and MAD and MOST as well, to develop uh, more training and also um, research opportunities. Um, so thanks for your attention, everyone. And um, I'll just uh, stop sharing screen. Thank you very much, Mark. That was fantastic. In fact, thank you to each of you. Um, I see that... Um, we're just running a little bit short on time, so I won't call for any questions from the audience, but Mark, it was fantastic to hear about uh, the research focus. That is an area that we had signposted for a future uh, in-person event. Uh, Jenny, it was fantastic to hear about vocational training. And certainly for those back in Australia, we know that uh, the training and assessment is a key pillar for, um, uh, for all industries. Um, uh, and then it was also fascinating, Ian, to hear how a great partnership would work. I was particularly interested in, in hearing about mentors for each teacher and that sort of uh, coaching and support um, for getting a curriculum in place overseas. I think that's really quite innovative and fantastic. So, so thank you, uh, each of you. That, uh, that concludes the series of three presentations on the topic of partnerships between institutions in Australia and Vietnam. And so, ladies and gentlemen, um, what we'd like to do now is to start to um, wrap up some learnings and conclusions from the last two days. And the way we were hoping to do that is to shortly break out into three separate rooms. We will assign um, uh, uh, moderators in each room. They will be members of the OSCHAM Education and Training Committee. And they will guide you through some um, questions. Uh, at the end of that, we'd like to just come back uh, at 11.25 for a final symposium closing. And so folks, uh, it's just gonna take us a, a little bit of time just to get um, everybody into these three separate breakout rooms. So just bear with us for a minute. Once you jump in there, uh, expect just a few seconds of, of silence while we, while we get everybody together. Okay, we're just uh, organizing these breakout rooms now. Please do stay with us. These are great engagement sessions. It's a great time to meet the other people, the other delegates and the presenters that are here. And we'll see you when these are done back uh, for a final closure.
Okay, we're nearly ready to go. <laughs> There's quite a lot of people to assign the breakout rooms. Apologies, we're still uh, just arranging that. So just bear with us for a minute. Uh, some, as a reminder, um, the TV show is on VTV7. Um, that is uh, screening over the next few months uh, on the uh, topic of Shine with Australia. Okay, I think we're nearly ready to go here. Hi everyone and welcome to the breakout sessions. So uh, I hope that you could stay with us until the very end because it's only around 10 to 15 minutes. And if you are shy, you don't need to turn on your microphone to speak because certainly you can put your answer in the chat box, but we encourage everyone to uh, speak if you have any ideas or if you have any opinions that you want to contribute. So uh, before I start, uh, I will just share with you a quick uh, screen share of um, the questions that we have uh, prepared for today. I'm from Macquarie University. So I am the international Vietnam, Malaysia, Cambodia. And uh, I have more than 10 years of uh, experiences in higher education. Yeah, so uh, you can already see on your screen, these are some of the questions that we hope you, are, you could share your opinions with us. So the first question is, if you could use one word to describe Australian education. early 2022. So what is your number one priority? And questions number three is what challenges are you facing with regardings to doing business with Vietnamese or Australians business partners? So if you are Vietnamese uh, counterpart, what challenges do you face when working with an Australian partners? And for Australian partners, what challenges that you face when working with the Vietnamese partners? So yeah, as I mentioned before, you don't really have to, uh, you know, if you're shy, you don't really have to turn on your mic and speak about, but uh, you can just put that in the chat box and we would really much appreciate your answer because all the answer that we collect here, we will, uh, you know, share with the um, uh, Ostcham community member so that we could organize future events. I have a very close friend of mine here in the room, Ms. Hafam. Do you want to share with us, like what are your main priorities after the pandemic has been brought under control? Uh, I, um, thanks, Simon, um, and hello, everyone. Are we, are we getting to question number two, not question number one, Simon, or you want me to I think ask? yesterday you already, I think you, yesterday <laughs> yes. you already answered That's the question. That's my question, <laughs> okay. So main priorities, I think um, the quality of teaching and learning for students and um, uh, after switching uh, to online learning. So um, yeah, but we have managed to uh, bring that under control um, by applying some uh, measures. For example, for online learning, we split students into um, sm smaller groups. We um, reduce um, the class time um, divided into smaller sessions. We also use uh, different um, tools to make the lessons more interactive, such as like uh, Miro. So students participating at the same time with the teachers. So it's not like just one way teaching. 
And we also have a supervisor in the classroom to make sure that students um, are, you know, um, turning their camera all the time, participating all the time. Um, yeah, so I think uh, the main priorities for us actually is the quality of teaching and learning and for students to still maintain um, their, um, their, their, their learning progress, their assessments and everything, because everything would go towards their ATAR score at the end. So, yeah, so by doing that, um, I think we have managed to um, bring that under control. I don't know if that answers the question, Simon. Yeah, I think that's an excellent answer. Like to myself, uh, as someone who uh, who is working in, in higher education, I think my number one priority is after the pandemic, is probably, you know, having that face-to-face -face engagement. I know that all of us are pretty tired and, you know, burned out by all these online deliveries, you know, the Zoom meetings. So I couldn't wait to build that human-to-human -human connection again through the actual face-to-face -face engagement. So, uh, yeah. And uh, what about everyone else? Like, if you have any, like, if you have your opinions on this, please feel free to put that in the chat box, or you can raise your hands uh, and then you know discuss with us. I also see Tao from, uh, you know, University of Adelaide. Tao, would you yeah. like to uh, contribute and answer one of the questions? Hi, Simon. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah. Thank you. Well, um, it's been pretty amazing since this morning. Um, I've been learning a lot and uh, there's a lot to process through. I think um, there's something in my mind that's um, just about AIs and the advanced technologies are uh, viral over the world. So um, I've been looking at some of the um, sort of new technologies that help the interaction online for student at K-12 and um, I'm just wondering um, why are we worrying that the student at K-12 might have some sort of lacking of the independent learning and lacking of the interaction with the lecture? Is that because of the uh, teachers actually need to upgrade the way that they can use more new technology so that they can um, make the student more interact in the lesson. So yeah, it's just, um, it's not a question. It's just something that I want to discuss. If teachers are willing to have more training and let's say self-improvement, because we know that there's a lot of technologies that are coming up every day, there's new startup, uh, even in Vietnam. So uh, yeah, it's just something to really ask all of the educators, especially teachers, if we are willing to um, learn and, and upgrade ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is a great uh, question to pitch to the uh, group of audiences here. So yeah. if you have any opinions on this, I would appreciate your answer as well. Well, Thanks, you know, sir. like, uh, I totally agree with Tao on this. Like, you know, it's not only the student has to you know, survive the online delivery is also the teacher because they are the ones who delivers the content to the students. And sometimes, you know, teachers, they are too busy with their day-to-day -day delivery and teachings that they are lagged behind from all these updates from technologies, all these new uh, technologies that they have to use in their learning. So what, um, what about you, Jihan? Like, do you have any input on this because you are an expert uh, in the high school sector. So you probably know Smella. Uh, thanks, Simon. I think I misunderstood the question at the first time. I think the priority after the pandemic would be, um, I think to build um, an integrated uh, or, or blended systems that allow us to switch back to online or offline anytime we want. So, or maybe doesn't need to, um, I mean, it doesn't need to another, for another pandemic to happen, but we can look into a more flexible mode of learning and teaching, a blended, a more flexible, so allow students to um, have offline and online learning. And because 
those are the skills um, that they will need for the future. So I would think um, the priority would be to have a system in place, um, not only for another for the next pandemic, but also for a consistent um, a way of learning and teaching for, I would think, uh, education of the future. Awesome, thank you for your answer. I can see in the chat box that David Nguyen is here. And David is the CEO of an ed tech companies, right? David, do you want to talk about, you know, what your company is about? And, you know, because I certainly interested in, you know, what you are offering right here. Yep. Thank you, Simon. Um, yeah, I, I, thank you, everyone. Hi, hi everyone. My name is David Nguyen from n 2 AI, um, a company based in Sydney. So basically, I, I do agree with what whatever Jay has said about, you know, it's not because of the, the pandemic that is forced the, the university and, and also the higher education sector um, to uh, utilize the technology to, to help to deliver better quality and also the, the outcome for students. Basically, that is just the, 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 the factor to push it, um, um, you know, faster and earlier. If it doesn't happen, uh, the, the world will move into it that way anyway. Um, in, in the way that you know, many companies now they don't really look at the, the degree as a full um, uh, for students to learn, but they more uh, uh, interest in the skill the student learn from that. And you know, you will see the the, the process of learn, unlearn, learn, unlearn happen all the time. So lifelong learning, and then especially the practical learning from. Uh, from the emerging technology, all of that thing will be the critical point for the higher education sector at the moment to provide uh, for students. So basically, my company, um, we, we have a product, uh, which is uh, the robot um, for manufacturing product. And we, we mm. sold that product for like, about 40 um, countries around the world and include like, some of very high-end, um, um, the, the top-notch um, university in the US and UK, they bought it for students to use in the lab. We have the robot version for the lab to for them to do the experiment. We have the robot for the for the manufacturing to, to do for the smart manufacturing. So from that work, we have a lot of partners around the world where we can play the student in for the industrial training and 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 and, uh, and internship. So from that part, part at the moment we are setting up what we call this digital campus, an initiative where we have to allocate a lot of, um, um, you know, of, um, you know, students from our university partner in Australia um, for the global um, uh, partner in the industry. So students can go in for the internship with the company where they use our robot, uh, our, uh, our industrial robot, where the student learn from our education robot in, in the lab. So in that way, we have the, the industry um, utilize the skill that students learn and also we have the students to use the, the skill they learn from our robot for the, the real life um, problem. And, and because of the pandemic, we couldn't send students to another world partner. So at the moment we send them to Australia partner, but uh, when the pandemic, the pandemic end and then when students can travel around, we definitely can send students to like, you know, we have the, the, the client in, in, in um, Spain where they use the robot to pick up some mushroom. We have the mm. and in Japan where they use the robot to pick up the carrot like in, in the um, in the food uh, and in um, agriculture. Uh, so that that is like um, I think that is the way because what I can see um, uh, um, you know in, in China they definitely doing that in a very very good way. They accelerate the whole um, uh, the big big lab where a lot of robot they bought in and students can use it for any type of industry. They replicate any type of industry in the lab and the student can learn it. So when I see that massive scale in China, I said, geez, that is, that is the way China will be one of the leader in the automation and in robotics for the smart manufacturing. And I think Australia, especially in Vietnam, we are way behind. We don't move faster in that way. We will be way behind in, in like compared with China and the other country. Wow, thank you, David, for your contributions. What you're doing right now is future forward. I, I don't even think it's future forward. It's happening now, and we just need to get that on that boat quickly. So I think it would be very relevant to you uh, to ask the third questions. Like if you had worked with any Vietnamese partners, like what challenges are you facing with when you are working or doing business with a Vietnamese partner? Uh, for Vietnamese partner, um, especially that very good question, Simon. I, 
Um, so when I'm talking about robot, um, the robot we we manufacturing is the robot for manufacturing, right? That is industrial robot. We also partner with another provider from Silicon Valley where they provide a robot for the service. So what happened in Vietnam? Actually, at the moment we are running some um, like one of the program we call this uh, uh, industry university partnership where we provide seven university in, in the south in, in Ho Chi Minh City and uh, sorry six in Ho Chi Minh City and one in Da Nang. Uh, we provide them the robot and this uh, this type of robot is for for business so we 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 partner with the silicon valley provider where we provide them the robot and this this type of project can help the student not only in engineering but it's also in medical in, in law in business in marketing um they can actually partner um and they can be part of the team where they can work with the student from engineering to build a solution for um, using this, what we call a service robot, so we can be the like you know virtual assistant in the bank. Uh, it's a telehealth for the medical, or it's a, like um, uh, the the smart assistant in the law office. So they, uh, we provide them uh, that seven euros thing. We provide them the robot kit, and they can be, be, be develop any program like use for robot for service, and we will help them to sell that um, that service to the global market uh, within our network. So if we can do that and the student can get the benefit, the university partner with us, we get a benefit and then they can get some income from that. And we help them to, um, to, to you know, like my, from, from my image is like, robot is not only, not only for engineering students, robot is, will be for everyone. So with the industrial revolution 4.0, uh, a lot of jobs will be disappeared, right? And a lot of jobs will be created. So we want yeah. the student uh, graduate from university in Vietnam or in Australia will be the, uh, on top of that, they will be some sort of the, uh, the part of the future workforce where they create the work and they use the robot to, to do a better thing for our life. And then that is the way we want to do. So that's why we partner with the Silicon Valley provider to yeah. um, to fulfill the robot, robotic, uh, automation and robotic um, environment, not only for the industrial the smart manufacturing, but also for the service. So that is awesome. one of the problems. So Thank you, David. You have uh, we have one minute until we leave this room to back to the main room. But you already have a potential customer right here, Tao from University of Adelaide. So right. Tao asked a question: How accessible for public university with limited budget to access the service from your company? Very good question, Tao. Um, our 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 our, aim, our target is to support a public university, so the price is very cheap. We already talking about that for many universities in Australia, and and then the, the, the price is not like ten thousand dollars something like that that is cheaper. And then we 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 support the university not only um for the benefit but also for the social impact. So that's why you you can talk talk to me Tao, later on, and we can discuss about that. No problem. Awesome. Thank you, David, for your input. We have twenty seconds left, and uh, I'm not really sure if your company is, is already a member of Ausgem. But Ausgem is a connection between, you know, Australian companies like institutions and uh, the Vietnamese counterparts. So when you become a member, you will be connected to a lot of good contacts and, you know, uh, companies based here in. So, so I believe that's everybody back now, uh, Andrew, from the breakout rooms, right? That's okay. correct. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our series of sessions for the symposium. Uh, we intentionally tried to keep this event to just two hours each day, and two hours does go very quick. Uh, some presentations will be uploaded to the Ozcham YouTube channel next week, and we hope you can take away a few key points from these sessions. Uh, please uh, leave any final feedback in the chat box for us in these last couple of minutes. We would greatly value that uh, as we prepare for next year. I would like to thank the presenters and the institutions they represent from today. That included leaders from Austrade, the United Nations International School or UNIS as, as it's affectionately known, the Ho Chi Minh City Open University, Nice Australia, Ericsson, Albert Einstein School, Chisholm Institute and the University of Queensland. Heads of institutions will know of the importance of working with your relevant authorities in Vietnam. And on this note, we would like to thank the attendance from various government departments, as well as the keynote address yesterday from the Ministry of Education and Training. Whether it's uh, OIT or DOIT for schools, DOLISA for vocational institutions or MOIT, um, these educational relationships between authorities and institutions are essential. So thank you for your attendance. Um, Conference and symposia are a very great opportunity to bring together like-minded people to engage in dialogue and in thought leadership with peers and experts. 
I would like to thank in particular the OzCham Education and Training Committee for putting this event together. The ideas that come up will hopefully help you to future-proof your institutions as we transition to this new normal and beyond. Larger in-person education events are envisaged by OzCham for 2021, both in Ho Chi Minh City and in Hanoi, which will include more networking opportunities, face-to-face -face time, booths, and displays the latest solutions in educational innovation, such as EdTech and so forth. There will also be a great opportunity for forging new partnerships and relations. Please keep this in view and mark it in your calendar when the pandemic is behind us. On behalf of OzCham Vietnam, thank you. Thank you.